Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Season 3, A Little Perspective with your hosts, Coach Ange and myself, Samyukta. We are excited to share another perspective of one of our lovely guests today. Um, this year, our season theme is Advocates and Authors. So our guest today is Miss Angela Van Etten. I will um, have Angela <laughs> our own <laughs> coach and <laughs> yeah right which one <laughs> yes. I, will, <laughs> I will have coach and take over and introduce um Angela for us <laughs> take it away and <laughs> awesome yeah we are so excited and you know what a great name like of course it's awesome <laughs> so Angela is a um, published author and an advocate she is a woman who has a dwarfism and you know she really um she's able to speak to advocacy um history and um the 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 importance of uh allyship and um awareness as well so um angela why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself okay um well i am privileged to have completed my official work life or paid work life so in other words I, I used to say I was retired now I'm an author so I don't write retired um, but I uh, originally grew up in New Zealand and I came to the United and I, that's where I did my education and my first five years of employment where I had trained and worked as a lawyer for five years and then I came, we came upon 1981, which is the International Year of Disabled People. And I applied for a Winston Churchill Fellowship. And that's what brought me to the United States to study uh, the disability civil rights laws in the United States and public education. How do we change the attitudes of people towards those with disabilities? And I had the opportunity to travel around the country, the United States for three months visiting with different disability organizations. And that kind of got me really deep into um, uh, advocacy. And uh, before that, really, I, I hadn't done much with other organizations, other disabilities, other than Little People of New Zealand. And so I, I really, um, well, an unexpected event happened <laughs> when I was in the country. I met this man and for, believe it or not, we had a whirlwind romance and we uh, got engaged before I left the country. <laughs> and then six months later, we got married. And so I eventually, well, then he came to New Zealand, we got married, I came and lived in the US. So I had to go back to law school, kind of explored all that part, it was part of my big decision. I'm like, am I gonna do this? Immigrate was, I mean, it was, was more than just getting married. I was changing everything in my life. So I uh, decided to do it. We're still married 42 years later. So it was obviously the right decision. And um, so I went back to law school and I went to the University of Maryland. And that launched me uh, into Little People of America. Because he was nonprofit work for LPA and a series of jobs which all related to the law. I did graduate from the University of Maryland Law School and uh, so yeah it's a long story it's too much to tell but well I'll we'll let it come out slowly through the questions questions that Ange wants to to ask me but where she wants me to focus but uh, yes so of course there's a lot to a lot happens in a lifetime so people did you can't when you have conversations with people you talk to a reporter you know all the different things that come up in life there's not enough time to tell your story so that's what got me into writing so i first wrote the first book uh, dwarfs don't live in doll houses which this week um i just wrote a blog for three years this week was the dwarves don't live in dollhouses turned 35 this week so oh, 35 wow. years ago it was published 
And, so the uh, first yeah, book so, you wrote. And they still use copies out there. It's pretty amazing. And that one I wrote because I got so aggravated with reporters not getting the, the gist of what I wanted to say. They would pick up on the wrong things and the headlines were horrible. So finally I thought, i got to write this for myself. And yeah. uh, and then I Let me stop I you there because I want to ask you a ahead. question yeah. about that. So you said that um, you wrote it uh, because of reporters. Is that is that to do with your law degree, with your law career? Or does that have to do with like Well, writing? it really, and initially it was when I was in New Zealand and I had, there was a lot of reporting around my getting uh, the Winston Churchill Fellowship. Um, oh. And that because it was a national um, uh, award and a lot of people apply for it. And it was only, I don't know how many in a year, but about 20 and um, not too many. It was pretty prestigious award. So it attracted a lot of media. And of course, I had an obligation uh, when I came back from the States to report of my findings. And that brought me to a lot of uh, media as well. So I just, some of the reports were okay, but many of them I really didn't care for the emphasis they made. And I, what I really enjoy the most as far as media goes is radio, which is why I like these podcasts, because we can, if, if we, if the person I'm talking to is having trouble understanding, I can see it, you know, we can hear it and mm -hmm. other, somebody's reiterating what I'm saying. So, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I should have wanted, you know, you can change the impression you're making. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like radio because um, live conversations are good. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's what got me to writing. And of course, even in the best of interviews, you still only got a limited time. Whereas if you write a book, 50, 60,000 words, <laughs> you've got a lot yeah. of space. And maybe like the third book that I wrote, <clears throat> um, which came out in 2021, is an audio book. And uh, that's five hours. So I've got five hours of talk <laughs> in that book, or five and a half or something like that. But it's the only one that's the audio book. It's a lot of effort doing an audio book. Did you do the audio for the audio? I did book? read it myself, but my voice is not very strong. And I so I could only do a couple of chapters per session. And so it, we had several sessions. But thankfully, I know this guy who's a, a retired broadcaster and he had all the equipment and he kind of guided me through the process. Couldn't have done it without him. So you told us yeah. what made you kind of interested in writing. What made you get into law? Well, interesting. I I didn't. It was a process of elimination. I knew that I needed to go on with my education. wasn't going to be making money, you know, based on my physical abilities. So I had been encouraged by my parents and teachers and all to stay in, in school, go on to university. But so I had to decide what to study. So really, I ruled out just about everything else, and mainly because I wasn't any good at it or not interested. So uh, like, so I'm not a science type person. So that ruled out a lot of things. And uh, I didn't really want to be a teacher. But finally, I had an aunt say to me, well, what about law? And I, I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I really have was in the back of my mind I really would have liked to be a journalist but I couldn't quite picture myself you know chasing a story at you know going out to a fire and or you know some kind of incident and nobody would see me I'd get pushed aside but so I didn't couldn't quite see that happening so I thought maybe I could be a law reporter or something like that but I never did go into that line of work with the degree but that's why I went down to study law it was a good choice. That's awesome. Could you um, share your experiences growing up in New Zealand and now that you've spent some time in the United States, what, what are the differences in how people with disabilities have been treated and the barriers that you faced in New Zealand and how do they compare um, to the U.S.? Well, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I would say probably there was a lot more similarities and differences because wrote at that time when I was growing up to say in New Zealand there was no laws to protect you there was no 
individuals with disabilities education act that would, would require you to be educated with your peers same age peers not in separated classes unless you had a reason to be in a different class um and so a lot of people say like judy human was separated when she was growing up because of access issues and uh, they just didn't have a way they, they weren't required to include the children with mobility issues in regular classes so uh but now she was growing up now or if i was growing up um in new zealand now it is now mandatory to include the children to keep them together but of course you have to fight access but that's one of the advocacy roles that i played in my the last job i had that i retired from i was an advocate for a center for independent living and i would go to uh, meetings to make sure the kids got their uh, due process uh, but anyway back to New Zealand the difference is um, I I was in a small town I, I had the same opportunity I went through school from elementary to middle to high school with the same group of kids so I really I didn't have a lot of the issues that kids do here where, where you get on a bus and you shipped off to a, a school that's miles from where you, you don't you know that's the problem in the United States. I think kids are shipped, shipped off, bust away from their home, and they they're with unfamiliar. You know, people they have a big uh, job ahead of them to get to get the the student body accustomed to their presence, because you know little people do attract a lot of attention, and it uh, takes time for people to settle down and you where you just blend in just like the other kids. In the end, they get tired of pointing at you. And um, but and your friends, if if you come through with the same group of friends from year to year, uh, they help you. To, when it is somebody new in the school, um, they help you deal with all of those other kids. So I I think that it's it can be harder for a lot of kids here because they're changing schools and the schools are so large too. Um, the population in New Zealand is much smaller. It's like a little town compared, like here, for instance, and little people in New Zealand, it's like a chapter or a district, say, in the LPA. And there's no reason to say, well, I was president of little people in New Zealand. That's like being a district director. And uh, in the US, uh, it's, it's, it's massive. There's so many people. So uh, I, my high school was like 1,200, so I guess it was pretty pretty big. But um, I do think that New Zealanders are more matter of fact uh, to sort of take things uh, in our stride a little better, maybe, maybe not. Um, it's hard to generalize, really. Uh, people, though, it can be just as cruel. They're cruel in both countries. They're kind in both countries. You know, human nature is pretty is the same. We have we all have the capacity to do well and to do poorly, and uh, but what I, about I like policies though? How you know how are the the policies or how is the disability culture? Is there um, is it kind of the same where we're there's you know working through evolution or is it more of um... well yeah I think New Zealand and a lot of countries uh, and why I came to the United States on my fellowship the United States was ahead ahead of, of New Zealand ahead of a lot of countries and uh, I have to agree you know sometimes I think Americans have a tendency now I'm talking like I'm not one of you guys because now I am a naturalized <laughs> citizen but I can see things you know, from a different perspective. But um, sometimes the United States can be a little, you know, boastful, uh, proud, whatever you want to call it, about being the best and the greatest. And, and it's kind of comical when you go uh, sightseeing and you see, you know, this is the biggest and whatever in the world. You think, really, <laughs> whose world is that? But um, the in the disability arena, the United States was way ahead. And as in respects of access, the civil rights laws, they were ahead. And that's why I came to the US to study that. 
and to see what was required and what the organizations were doing to educate people. So, but New Zealand has caught up, uh, but they, they were, so when the 1981 and the fell, I got the fellowship, I went to a meeting, I was discussing, okay, what is New Zealand going to do um, for I, uh, international year of disabled people? And uh, I remember sitting in the group and I couldn't believe it because there was this woman saying, she was listing off all the things that people with disabilities should be asking for. Like, you know, oh, well, we should ask for increase in benefits and we should ask for that, that, that. And I think so I stood up in the group and the heads got turned. I said, I don't think that's what we should be doing. I think we should be looking for what we can contribute and, you know, coming at it completely the opposite <laughs> end of this person. So it, the perspective needed to be changed. And, um, and it has, it has changed. Mm -hmm. But I'm sorry, that doesn't satisfactorily answer your question. No, <laughs> no, it really does. No, but you do. Okay. That's great. You yep. sure did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could you talk some more about the, the books that you wrote and maybe like a summary of them or just like the highlights of them? Like The highlights of what? Of your books. Like, so oh, my book. I, okay. Yeah, so we've um, seen that. Well, yeah, the first one, Dwarfs Don't Live in Dollhouses, was pretty much about growing up. Um, I kind of go through the first few chapters. Uh, school, the way I was raised in my family. Um, I was my parents taught, treated me like the other two kids in the household, and um, so I wasn't spoiled. I got chores. I was disciplined, and and all of that. So then, um, it wasn't special. <laughs> And um, then, so that was home and then school and how I was treated. Some teachers wanted to give me special treatment and that my parents offset that as well. They uh, made sure I wasn't given um, extra. And then also I didn't want to be treated because of the way I was raised. I sensed when somebody was giving me extra, uh, you know, special treatment, I, I re resisted. I won a, um, I went to a camp when I was about 10 and uh, kids camp and it was a week and at the end of the week I got an award for camp for the week and I thought that's ridiculous. I never earned this award. I didn't do anything to earn being camp for the week. So the, the reward, the benefit I got from that was I could go to the camp next year for free. I refused to go. <laughs> I was oh my God. 10 years old. I said, I didn't own that. I they just did it because I'm a little person, you know. So I no, that wasn't right. So, you know, this these things, I'm sure some of it was and came from the way I was raised, but it also came from inside me. Like God, mm -hmm. I think he gave me a sense of no, I'm not, I don't need this special treatment. I need to be equal. I need don't want you to raise me up on a pedestal. I don't want you to put me down as not being good enough for this or that I don't belong here. Just give me the accommodations that I need that levels the playing field. But no, we're not going to do it by you making me into a superhero or whatever. Uh, I used to tease my husband because he had an uncle who I, I think he gave him credit for getting up in the morning. I mean, he just, <laughs> he just thought Robert was wonderful and, and it's like, well, of course, Robert is wonderful. I married him, but it's not. He had it down all, all the wrong way. So I, I didn't, I resisted the special treatment. So, um, okay, so to school, and then I talked about going to university. That, that's a whole chapter. Then I talk about the little people uh, getting together and our shared experience and why it's difficult um, sometimes because getting together actually makes it harder. If you go out in a group, because wow, if you think one person attracts attention, go out as a crowd. <laughs> as a group of but you know, there's safety in numbers, but also you really um, are, are going to. And so that's when we attract the media as well. So just talk about how we can use it to our advantage. I talk about coming to terms with your own identity, especially as a teenager, because there's some hard times. And when the dating scene takes and you, you don't really, at least I wasn't anyway. Um, a part of that, I had a lot of friends, but 
when it came time for the school dance, I didn't get invited that close. And, well, some girlfriends told me to come, you know, that we danced together, but it's not the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so I go through all that. But then I kicked into, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a weird book, that first one, The Dwarfs Don't Live in Dollhouses, because I shift into issues. And, and for example, the last chapter is on dwarf tossing. And uh, kind of, probably made, so it's, I had a hard time classifying the book for dwarf to, uh, as an autobiography, because now they call them memoirs, which makes it a little better, because a memoir doesn't have to be your whole life. You can the just whole thing. Mm -hmm. a portion. So that's really what it was. Um, and I talk about access issues in the chapter at your sister as well. I talk a person through a day in the life and all the different barriers you encounter with stairs and elevators and everything else. Um, attention gives opportunity. I discussed that. I talk about what a, a lot of, of how, not just how I reacted, but how other little people react. So I just had some research and wrapped into it. And uh, yeah, so that's book one. Book two, Pass Me Your Shoes, was really only supposed to be two books because the first book was written from the point of view of a single person. And when I met Mary Robert and moved here, I didn't finish the book until I came and lived in the US. And, uh, but I didn't change it. I kept with my original plan because I thought it really kind of takes it off course to talk about being married. So when people bought the book, those people who knew us expected to read about our romance, which wasn't there. So <laughs> we would say, oh, well, wait for book two. But yeah, that was a long wait, like 32 years before book two appeared. And mm. meanwhile, I've had a lot of uh, experiences and I couldn't fit it all in, into one book. So that's why it became a second book, Pass When Your Shoes, uh, was, is about our marriage. And the third book, Always an Advocate, is focused on the advocacy issues exclusively. Yeah, so it sounds like your book is really such a, a wonderful reference. And then, of course, when it's told from real experience, then there's a nice story that goes along with it. Um, you know, we, Samith and I, are, we're part of an anthology because we we know the power of telling our, our story and our perspective and, and how it can help people better understand our, our struggles right. so it right. really sounds like your book has every piece of it that that we would need between the personal yep, the, really. <laughs> the legal and everything so that's wonderful um yeah. you know I think the um the last question I would ask because we're running out of time is um you know as as authors like it it's hard to put your words out there, especially when it's nonfiction, it's a memoir or autobiography or what have you, um, because you are, you know, you're putting yourself out there. And so there's a lot of people that want to do it, but but they don't necessarily do it. Um, so what advice would you give to those who are letting fear get in the way and, and not doing and, and putting their, their book or their work, whatever it may be out there? Um, yeah, well, you really have to know why you're writing, why, why mm -hmm. you're writing, and and you have to hang on to that, and you have to be very uh, focused, um, you know, self-discipline as far as setting time aside, but to be honest, I really couldn't finish the, uh, I stopped and started many times, a lot of interruptions, but I was, I, I picked things up where I left off, like it might have been a, <laughs> a break of like several years, I mean, this, through the last book, um, I was, on a roll and then I had to have uh, open heart surgery. I mean, you name it, it's interruptions. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, after that, I, I couldn't work right and and commitments that I had with, with church and things. I couldn't do it all. So I thought, this is gonna have to wait till I retire. So I retired as soon as I hit to 65 so I could get Medicare and um, so that I could finish th these books. But I had, planned all along and people say well how do you remember all that I don't remember it all because but I did keep records I have letters emails minutes you name it articles uh, a lot of the things that I have done and what I've done and 
So I had a lot of material to go through to, to put it together. So, you know, what I'd say if somebody wants to write a book, if you've never written much, it's really not the place to start. You're better off writing smaller things, articles, um, and um, blogging, because well, right now, it's, you know, it's really the thing to do. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, though. I'm blogging every week, which is, that's a lot. But, that is a um, lot. It's 500 words, you know, it's not too much, but it's trying to be keep it fresh. That's the thing. So you just have to, excuse me, have to keep writing. And that's um, important. Of course, you have to have something to say as well. <laughs> I had plenty to say. <laughs> touche, yeah. my friend, touche. Huh? <laughs> I said touche, but it sounds like you have plenty to say. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, I talk a lot about, um, and then the other thing, because I didn't tell you what kind of jobs I'd done, and I just said you're out of time, but one of the things that I had learned to do and what the job when I worked for Thomson Reuters was research. And I love to research as well as write. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I can write um, something, uh, write about something that I've really never thought about too much before. If I do my research, then I pull it together. I know it's a topic that's of interest and concern. And um, see, I don't use a wheelchair, but I'm highly aggravated with all of these people's wheelchairs that are getting damaged by the airlines. Oh, so, yeah. you know, I do a lot of reading and research to pull a blog post together on that. Oh, so, that would yeah, be awesome. It's, it's, um, we actually have um, somebody that we're going to be interviewing to talk about that. My sister had her wheelchair destroyed by Delta years ago. She's since passed away, but, um, and then um, the person that we're speaking to has struggled with the same, and he's a, he's a local advocate um, in Mississippi. Right. And and so we're going to talk to him. So when you finish that, I'd love to see it. That would be wonderful. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I've done a couple, but um, so do you put on your uh, podcast where people can go to find out, like, where the blog is and stuff like that? Okay. Yeah, uh, so I think Samutha is just about to ask you that question. <laughs> you yes. must be psychic. Yes, <laughs> it, that's exactly because I, I was going to say we're unfortunately have to we're running out of time. But um, to wrap up, I was going to ask you how can a like uh, people get in touch with you like for the blog and like the article that you're planning to write on the wheel on the struggles people have with their wheelchairs being damaged and. Where can they get a copy of your books? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, I would say the easiest way is to go to my website, Angela Muir Van Etten. I've got my maiden name in the middle because Angela Van Etten is more than one of us. So it's Angela Muir, M-U-I-R. Well, you have my, um, well, I should say it because it's coming out on the, online, but Angela Muir, M-U-I-R, like in Muir Woods than Etten because apparently I've still got an accent <laughs> apparently <laughs> people don't we will it put that I... in the notes um for you in in wherever we post this we'll put that in the notes for 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 the yeah. viewers as well and so. and so at the website you've got the blog you've got the information on the books and some resources uh and uh, any media that I've done some other podcasts and things awesome so I mean, I'm advocating um, that I, when I put a book, I put one of the words I took autograph is be an advocate for positive change. Be an advocate because it's interesting how somebody, you know, and of course, I, uh, the website also gives you my social media locations. Um, somebody texted me or whatever they were talking on Facebook. They said, oh, we found another issue for you. And I'm thinking, you kind of. <laughs> they found it for you. <laughs> uh oh. Did we lose you there? What she was saying is she, when she signs her book, she says, be an advocate. Because she has had That's people perfect. say that they found another, they found something else for her to battle. But lovies, that is not how this works. You get to take this information and carry on and be an advocate. 
we were wrapping up anyway. Um, and so we have her website um, and we will put that in the comments, comments but it's Angela Moyer, M-U-I-R, Van Etten.com. Um, and you can get her books, her blog, and everything there. She, um, I believe she does do some public speaking and such as well. So um, you connect with her there. She is so lovely. And we're so grateful to have her. I hate that we can't tell her goodbye, but uh, we're wrapping up anyway. So I love all of you. I hope you have the most wonderful day. Bye, y'all. Have a good night.